Now, with that out the way, let's get on with the main show. Today, I'm joined by webcomic superstar Justin Westover, aka JL Westover, who in 2021, just three years ago, made history by breaking into the highly competitive top 10 all time webcomics Kickstarter with his Eisner-nominated original graphic novel, Mr. Levenstein Presents Failure. And despite its name, Failure was far from that. Failure was funded in five hours and raised over $220,000 to date to bring the project to life. I don't know Justin well, at least not yet. Maybe by the end, I'll be able to say he's a friend of the show. But it's safe to say he's not a man who rests on his laurels because he's back with a sequel comic. His new book, Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings, is in shops is in comic shops, bookstores, and digital platforms like Kindle and Google Play right now. As in, you can simultaneously be listening to the show, driving to your nearest comic shop or bookstore to go pick this up, and it's some amazing meta experience. All right, go go pick up Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings. Now, Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings is a collection, as the name probably suggests to you, it's a collection of fan-favorite Mr. Levenstein comics that celebrate feelings in all forms. Every emotion is on display in this book, from joy, sadness, rage, love, anxiety, and you guessed it, horny. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll cry some more. Justin I'm sorry, Justin helped us accept our failures in Levenstein Presents Failure, and now he's going to help us feel our feelings with a conversation about this new collection and what goes into making web comics. So without further ado, Shortbox Nation, let's welcome Justin Westover to the show. Hey, Justin, what up? Welcome to the Shortbox. Honor, thank you. Thank you for having me. What's up, Shortbox Nation? It's an honor to be here. I can't wait to talk about comics and, and feelings with you. That's, that's, that's all we want to do here in the short box. Well, you know what? How are you feeling today, Justin? We're recording on a Tuesday. Uh, it's a little <laughs> early for me to say, how's your week going? But I'll ask anyway, how are you feeling? How's your week going? You know, you know, it's not bad. We're out of the Keep Monday. it real. Keep it real. It's yeah, not bad. There we are. You know, I would love to meet somebody, though, who's like, who absolutely loves Tuesdays, though. That'd be a mm. unique kind of person. Like, I'm all about Tuesday. Even like Wednesday. Like, Tuesdays when I get in my groove, you know? So, that ain't me. But, that sounds... Uh, yeah, not going bad. How about you? How are you feeling? Nice to hear. You know, I have a weird relationship with Tuesdays. Tuesdays are my extremely busy days. I work a, a, a office job, so that's usually when, like, I do a lot of meetings. I do a lot of emails mm-hmm. that day. I also try to squeeze in like that. That is my absolute last day that I try to edit the pod. I'm also like uploading it. So it's a juggling act. And it can go one or two ways. Either I am awake until the wee hours of Tuesday, almost Wednesday, trying to get everything situated for a Wednesday podcast release, or I've completed it by lunchtime and I feel fucking excellent. The whole day. I feel like super accomplished. So today is a little Damn. bit on, it's kind of like in the middle, right? My Tuesdays is going pretty smooth right now. Hopefully I don't get in the way. You know? <laughs> Hopefully I'm not <laughs> slowing you down. No, not at all. We'll make not this all. quick. Anything. Nah, Justin, you got all the time. Though. Justin, what is, uh, huh? I guess, what is your, as a professional comic creator, what is your, like, day like do you have any designated days where maybe you do like work specifically like what what is the flow of your week like good question because i was thinking about that as you were talking about like you know tuesday is a crazy day because of just like how your production schedule is um usually my schedule's gotten kind of out of whack lately but usually tuesdays and fridays is when i drop like new comics so there is like actually like a pretty big build up to those days sometimes working through weekends but um uh i usually try to have one day in the week it's like wednesdays or saturdays that's just dedicated to writing and thinking about funny things and doodling and letting my mind wander and you know trying to generate as much ideas as i can and then honestly the rest of it is just goes right into like comic production boring ass social media stuff the tedious crap 
Um, I, not to say interacting with my lovely fans is tedious and boring. I, I love it, but uh, it's really just the repetition of like, okay, let's hop on Twitter. Okay, let's hop on Facebook. Let's, let's go over to Instagram and then repeat that the next day. Yeah, it's a, just a nonstop hamster wheel. I, I don't know the exact you know, feeling, but I, I, I know a similar feeling where to me, the, the funnest part is obviously the creation part. I, I even like, I'll be honest with you. I even enjoy creating like reels and video clips just because I've been doing audio for so long. I think making video stuff is like flexing a different muscle, a different creative thing, mm -hmm. but I hate everything that comes after hitting post. you know, the, the anxiety of, yep. you know, will the algorithms help me out today? Will I get any, you know, is anyone going to see this? So yeah, I, I feel you there. You know, we should play a little, uh, we should have a little counter at the bottom of the screen, a little feel counter. Every time I say feel. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll count that out. Um, <laughs> I'll just start shoehorning so, so, into every sentence. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious though, from, cause it's, is it safe to assume though, as a, as a web comic creator, does the marketing, is there a little bit of help in the marketing aspect when you consider that your comics, and I, I, I know this from, from my personal experience, I'm curious yours, but it's being shared online. Like, you know, people are, are sharing that, you know, like web comics, I feel like are, are very easily shared and do well on social media, whether like, mm -hmm. you know, you have a personal account, you only post things of your family or like, regardless if it's even like a big brand, I feel like I see web comics shared by a wide range of like, users especially whether it be in and, and it's applicable to i'm sorry it is it can be posted like everywhere right whether it be on twitter mm -hmm. or instagram or even facebook like who doesn't like a good web comic being shared or reposted like it, do you find that in your experience that social media helps yes i think it's like a double-edged sword so on the one end exactly what you said comics uh like short form comics like mine where you read it in like 10 seconds, move on, and just a little picture. It's like a match made in heaven with like the modern landscape of social media. Like they were around before social media, but when they like, you know, came together, you know, it was like perfect harmony. Um, where I, you know, I, I get, I get the frustration of like other creators where it's like you have, even in the comic world, you got like a really long story with a bunch of panels and stuff like that. It doesn't organically work well in, you know, like, algorithm feed yeah. or like if you're an author and you write books or even like paintings you think would do well but people want to be entertained and not be like you know pondering a beautiful painting on their on their phone so absolutely i don't take it for granted that like my comics are just are built to do well on social media on a flip side um social media giveth and social media taketh and uh Bars. We need to put that on. Yeah. Shirt, Justin. That's some bars right there. <laughs> we uh, are completely subservient to the almighty algorithm and what decides to show and not show. Um, and what's weird is we kind of live and breathe on social media and our posts have to like hang out with everything else going on in the world. Like it's, you know, like my comic about, you know, like some silly thing going on you know, someone, you know, crying their guts out because they spilled milk or something has to go up against like some crazy news story that just broke and someone, you know, posting a video of their cat being silly. You know, like I am, we are constantly like fighting with basically all other human existence that's being recorded to <laughs> the internet. And it's kind of fleeting, you know, like people like it's, it kind of feels like to the point where people call my comics like memes now which was not the case before now this is they see as a meme and memes are kind of felt like are viewed as like trash that you can you know you just look at it crumple it up and throw it away so it takes a while to like get people to actually care about you the creator and not just it not just be yet another funny little distraction on the on the feed that they're scrolling you know speaking of the almighty algorithm you have a fantastic comic in this feelings collection that I made sure to screenshot and I've been sharing it with a couple of folks that, you know, 
have a habitual issue of complaining about the algorithm and i sent it yeah. in jest but i think it's it's pretty damn funny about you know people not being as funny as they think they are maybe we'll use that as the the episode artwork but you brought up well i, I guess on you, you brought up how traditional comics traditional comics i use that in air quotes for our audio listeners don't do very well on you know social media and i had a question here about like do I guess, do you have any preference in what people call you when they're referring to like your occupation or your profession? Like, does it matter if someone calls you a web comics creator or a, just a you know regular comics creator? Like, does that distinction mean anything to you? Do you have a preference? Yeah, I would love people to refer to me as like an auteur or innovator or, you know, like a master of his craft. Uh, no, <laughs> but, uh, um, I really don't get too hung up on that. What's up? <laughs> well, I was going to say the the uh we've got a slight delay on the video, but it's making your jokes one land extra funny and two I can't tell, Great. you know, I I I don't have the exact timing. So, I took that I was like, "Man, he he holds himself in high regard. His self-esteem is up there." <laughs> on tour, Justin, the almighty mm -hmm. Justin. Right on. I'll take any help I can get with landing jokes. But yeah, like I, I don't actually get too hung up on what people think of me as. I do push back a little bit against like people who say like content creator, you know, like he's a content creator and it's just like, like content can just be anything like, you know, it's content could be anything from, you know, the Sistine Chapel to like, you know, fart, you know, it's just like, it's it's kind of immaterial. So, you know, I usually I refer to myself as like a cartoonist. Sometimes people call me like a comic artist or web comic artist. Definitely not an influencer. I'll tell you that. But yeah, you know, it's, it's something I really don't think about too much on a day to day. I just, I, I, I'm more just like, okay, I'm the guy who does uh, Mr. Lubenstein and uh, no one else quite does what i do and that's kind of my job is to keep it that way hmm. now where does the mr lovenstein story start like what, what series of events led you <laughs> to becoming a professional web comic creator and like it, like and i guess if you could also share any like major milestones or chapter markers that you know got you from your early beginnings to where you are now i will just Hopefully there's no one who can has like time travel abilities that's going to I'm going to explain and then they're going to go back and stop me from ever creating Love and Sign in the first place. I'd hate for that to happen, you know. Um, it happens more like than step you think. One, it kill Hitler, right? Step 2, stop Mr. Love and Sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in a nutshell, it 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 really did come out of uh, college. I mean, I've been drawing my whole life, and I, I even drew comics in high school that were just to entertain my my buddies. But um, in college, I was, you know, I had the bright idea to study art. I wanted to make a lot of money, and I said, "Go study art if you want to make tons of cash." Right? That's the safe career is art. So I'm in art school, and. Uh, I I had been dabbling with like animation and comics, but I never like took it seriously as like I'm gonna have a name for it and I'm gonna make it a series I I, I do regularly. And I finally bit the bullet and made a website, which was a big deal in 2010. And it's like okay, I'm gonna stick to this. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every week I'm gonna put some out, even if it sucks, and it usually did. And I was drawing it in my off hours just for fun, just to like see if anybody would read this thing and just having fun being in like in the webcomic space because I was a big webcomic fan myself. And I was heavily inspired by like the big the big names of time still around, you know, like Cyanide Happiness and, you know, uh, Nidroid and Perry Gun Bible Show. Fellowship and just all these guys just doing amazing work. And I just was like, oh, if I could just get a little taste of what that's like and so eventually i ended up becoming the comic for the 
college newspaper. And that really motivated like, okay, now I got some, <laughs> I know people are reading this. People who I have to actually interact with in real life are going to judge me now. So that really pushed me. And I did it as a hobby for four years and just incrementally got better and learned what the hell I'm doing and built up a kind of an audience. And then I went, you know, quote unquote professional uh, 10 years ago where I was like, let's see if I could live off the revenue from my comic. So just, just my comics. And uh, at first it was an absolute nightmare. And I was like, what? This was the worst mistake I've ever made in my life. And maybe it still is, but uh, I, I scraped by and, you know, kept working at it and building the audience. And that's just been it just since 2014, making comics every week and hoping to do well. Could you like, if you were to, if I was to ask maybe like that one to identify or pinpoint maybe that one moment where you felt like, okay, this is, you know, this is the turning point or, okay, I'm, I've made it. Like, do, do you have a memory or, or a moment to talk yeah. I got, I got a couple. One, um, this is probably the biggest one. I mentioned cyanide happiness earlier. Just an outsized presence in the in the comic world, and just had like just had a massive audience. Still does. They way back then, they had a little tiny section on their web page, just like off to the side, and it was titled "Stuff We Like." It's all it said, "Stuff We Like," and then it would just it was just like links to things that they liked. And I was such a tiny little operation um, that they decided, they found me. I don't know how. I, didn't, I had no idea that they knew I existed. They found me and linked to my website. Wow. And I went from getting like, you know, like a thousand to 10,000 views a month to just suddenly like my my weak tiny little baby servers were just like crashing and my website was going down and I'm just like what's going on like what's like why am I getting so much traffic and I'm like looking at my comics and I'm like these aren't that good and, and then I you know retraced the steps I was like holy cow these guys are promoting me and like they actually read my stuff and that was a huge huge boost this was like well, a year and a half in of just doing it as a hobby um and then another one was just um, on my own without the help of uh, anyone else. I just, I had a, a really viral comic and then I also never had that happen before. And it's just something that most people, I don't take for granted that most people don't even get to experience anything is blowing up and being seen by like hundreds of thousands of people. So I just happened to have a good comic and I, I just happened to post it at the right places at the right time. People liked it, and I, I was like seeing it like at the top of like Reddit and getting multiple hundred retweets, which I was just not. I was like, sometimes I post a comic, they'll get like zero retweets, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'll try better next time. Yeah. So, what, like little moments. What was like the comic that, about? It was like the one that went viral was. It's I I don't even post it anymore because I don't even think it's that good at this point. But it was a Christmas themed comic and it was like these two delinquent kids just like spraying graffiti on walls and smoking cigarettes and you know throwing bottles at cars and just being terrible and then inevitably Santa gives them coal for Christmas for being naughty boys and then it turns out that they were like horribly like impoverished and they were like freezing to death and they were going to use the coal to like warm their house up. And the mom's like, we're saved. We're going to survive. <laughs> so people liked it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I mean, that, that works. And there's no visual, you know, accompanying this. It's just you telling that that's, that works out a lot. And I find that, that sense of subversion, very common in, in your comics. Like your, this is my interpretation of, of your art, but your comics range from absolutely absurd some to to grounded sometimes, and then uh, other times it feels like you're holding a, a mirror to the inner parts of my soul and what I'm thinking or truly feeling in the moment. <laughs> if you had to maybe uh, 
if you had to describe your sense of humor or maybe the things that inspire you when you're creating your comics, other funny things or other comedic mm -hmm. things, like what, what is that? What does that Justin West over like blender looks like? What, what is it part of what? Gosh. Yeah. Now we're going really deep into the psyche of what horrible things are churning around up in my noggin. But I'll say like, on the surface level, I just, I like comedy like any other, anybody else. And I appreciate it. And there's just, there's mechanics that you need to understand that you learn about like timing and setup and like you said, subversion and misdirection, you know, when to like how to land a punchline. There's those little mechanical things that you just got to know. And I, you know, I like slapstick and people getting hurt and falling down and that kind of stuff. But, I think what I think is, I don't know, this is, it's hard to not talk about this without sounding like egotistical, but I think what makes Mr. Lovenstein special is that I do spend a lot of time thinking about my, like, my own, own internal struggles and the struggles of other people and like why, and this is what led to both making a book on failure and a book on feelings of just like, why do we do the things we do that we end up hating or like, why, why do we not like ourselves? Why do you know, why do we get so frustrated with ourselves? Um, and just like the times when people are really vulnerable, because I think you, you can cut two ways when you experience something like that. Right. When like you come across like a really vulnerable, awkward moment on the one hand, you want to be empathetic and sympathetic and, you know, and like, try to help and the other other hand is just like the america's funniest home videos mindset of just like trying to laugh through it and make jokes about it and then try to lighten it and try to like you know control it in a way with humor and i'm trying to like always like straddle that weird middle point of like there's some empathy and sympathy but also we're highlighting just you know there's some humor in the struggle you know, watching people suffer <laughs> for better, or for worse. Um, and, and I just, yeah, I find that funny. I, it's, it sounds twisted, but I find stuff like that kind of funny. No, I, I appreciate you saying that you dig deep or within yourself to, to bring these stories and, and these jokes to, to life. Like, you know, I think that's a sign of like a good artist, right? Someone that looks within to, to bring it forward, whether that be embarrassing or, you know, uh, personal or whatever it may be. I think you hit it on the head. I think humor is a very potent medicine when it comes to dealing with difficult topics like failure or even like feelings to some extent. Mm -hmm. And and on the topic of feelings, which I think the counter is up to uh, 71 feelings uh, in this nice. podcast episode alone. Let's get to um, this is This is the second time that you've teamed up with Skybound to not only launch a, a campaign, a Kickstarter campaign for both books, Failure and now uh, Feelings, but they also helped you bring the campaign and the project to life and into mm -hmm. you know, the mass market in a, a print physical form, a nice physical form. Uh, I think Feelings is, is a nice 200 page hardcover. I, I do find the mm -hmm. size pretty interesting, six by six, which I think yeah, lends itself to that, that web comic form. Yeah. Um, but this is the second time, right? Like you, you've now, how does it feel to catch lightning in a bottle twice? I, I mentioned in the, uh, in the intro that failure ran for a month of 2019, fully funded in five hours, raised over 220 K. You then topped yourself last year with the fee the Kickstarter campaign for feelings funded that in two hours, raised over 250,000. Once again, how does it feel to catch lightning in a bottle twice? Very, very lucky, and uh, I dare not tempt fate a third time, you know. But uh, it's it's a combination of things. I do feel legitimately just fortunate and lucky that things went so well. There's just you know, there's just things that can just go wrong, and there were things that went wrong, like during the feelings campaign. I don't know if y'all remember, but. Uh, Mr. Musk like bought Twitter and then it like lit on fire instantly and like mid campaign the that you basically couldn't tweet like they like limited like you can only look at 600 tweets a day or something like that like it was happening during my campaign so little stuff like that can 
you can't predict. But um, I think what helped was uh, I got a big enough audience, and they're really supportive. They're great. I love my I love my readers. Um, and then Skybound was able to give me the like the resources and manpower and support um, to take on such a massive project. I would not have been able to do these two books by myself. Um, and I know this because I put, I put out my own little self-published book, little known self-published book, like, uh, back in 2015. And, you know, that was, it was, a, it was a little my, like, modest success, but, uh, sucked the absolute life out of me trying to do that myself. So Skybound was, was, was very critical to the success of this because, you know, while I was able to focus on promoting and talking about the book and keeping up on all my social media, those guys were doing the, the grunt work of managing a Kickstarter page and customer service kind of stuff and you know the nuts and bolts that go on that you just you don't see. That that really was a secret sauce and just it also helped that these are collections and I stand by the f- that they are some of my best comics I've ever made. So hmm. I'm isolating and concentrating the best that I've had to offer over many, many years into one or two books. So I can, I can truly without full honesty be like, this is my best stuff. If you want my best stuff, wow. it's all in this book. That sounds, that sounds awesome to hear. I, I currently have, uh, I'm on Kickstarter and, and I guess you could look up, you know, you could apply certain filters. And right now I've got a filter on to show me web comic projects on earth sorted by most funded. You are among the top 10, but I noticed the number one and three slot is uh, Ava's Demon book one and two, mm-hmm. both also backed by Skybound. So I think it goes to what you were saying about Skybound being, you know, great yeah. partners and helping, you know, creators elevate and specifically what you said about them handling some of that behind the scenes stuff, the, the, I don't mm-hmm. know what is the term I'm thinking about, like the, the paperwork stuff. I can't think of, yeah. thank you. The admin stuff and letting the creator yeah. focus on creating and engaging exactly. their, uh, their audience. Now, yeah, they know what they're doing. You mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> Now you mentioned uh, the that little kind of uh, kerfuffle with Twitter, and I can o- only imagine, you know, as a as a, someone as a creator that is utilizing and running a Kickstarter campaign where every dollar counts and every you know minute counts towards mm-hmm. reaching your goal, having like a a social media platform and really like a channel to get your promote your work kind of taken underneath your foot, you know, alarming. But in the end, you succeeded. Like I said, uh, failure was funded in five hours what what do you think kickstarter campaigns and creators that utilize that platform what what do you think they most underestimate when it comes to running a campaign on kickstarter like do you have any tips uh, that Mm -hmm. you find that you personally use that that you find work when it comes to making or having a successful campaign yeah i think a really big one is like i said the things you don't see so you don't see how much prep goes into that launch day. And, you know, the, the work for these Kickstarters began like five, six months before we hit launch. So you got to really be prepared for the whole campaign day one. So, you know, you got to have, we like, we had the book ready to go. We had the, the page and the the promotional videos and the ads we were going to do and kind of a schedule of how we're going to promote it. We had guest artists lined up, ready to go. They had their artwork done for the book. Um, email lists, you know, like we gathered emails and had rewards for people if they signed up. Little, little things like that is critical. Because you do not want to be scrambling the once you hit go, because the other thing people underestimate is that it's usually 30 days. So it's like a month of nonstop pressure to get, you know, to 
get that Kickstarter as high as it will go because that's the only window you get. So you feel it from the moment you hit launch to the moment it ends. So anything, anything to take off the pressure and to not be scrambling, you know, like the first couple of days, like you didn't, you didn't think of something or you weren't prepared for something or you didn't plan out your budget, you know, the really boring stuff that artists like me don't really like to think about. That's really what makes or breaks a campaign. Hmm. I've seen one too many campaigns where they, like you can tell within like the first week or two, they just had no plan. Like they had like a great couple first days and then they're just like, uh, now what? I, <laughs> it's still going. <laughs> and I don't know. I've said everything I wanted to say. And yeah. And then, and then it just kind of freezes. It just grinds to a halt. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, really in the planning. Just hearing you describe how intense that month, my palms started getting sweaty as a very anxious yeah. person that overthinks. I started getting like my palms sweaty and I don't even have a campaign going on. <laughs> you said something in, you said something in another interview that I, I found interesting that was insightful to me and, you know, paraphrasing here, but you brought up how Amazon has kind of warped our expectations and, and understanding of like shipping times. And, you know, we're yes. used to things arriving in two days or three days, but with the lens of, of a, you know, comic creator or someone doing a Kickstarter campaign, it doesn't, the reality is, is that one production and shipping is very expensive and yes. the different hurdles, you know, that come with, you know, shipping things out. Can you speak to a, a little more to that? Uh, maybe providing a little more details or specifics? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to get into, like, some more nuts and bolts. I've straight up seen a couple campaigns that ended up losing money all when everything was done because they underestimated how expensive shipping is. So, like you said, yes, Amazon and now, you know, other platforms like them have completely warped our expectations of shipping where they'd expect it to be free. They expect it to be fast. And the reality is it's very expensive to ship stuff. Like it, it, like when you don't have, when you're not a massive, massive, massive corporation that can get just through sheer volume can get like really cheap rates to just ship a book costs a lot of money, especially when, when you think about it, Kickstarter is just like like starting from ground zero and then like ramping up like the production of one product like uh, that didn't exist prior and then that's it right like we ramp up get it made we ship it out that's it you know it's not like we're it's not like we're a factory that churns out uh, web comic books on a regular um so, and then like, I'm not like, that's not even considering like international stuff. And so like with, with failure, a big hurdle we had was we we did that in 2021. And I don't know if you remember, there was this like pandemic going on <laughs> and uh, we were kind of in the I thick of it. And, uh, yeah, there was some, something, something that went on around that time. I think it was in the news. Yeah. 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 You might've missed it. but. um all the things you heard about, like, you know, like, oh, supply chain issues, like su supply chain crisis. Like we were right in the mix, like the thick of that where like we had our, we had the books ready and we had them on like a ship, but the places where we needed to send that ship to could not receive the ship. So it just sat in the dock for like weeks and weeks and weeks and we're waiting to like get the okay for it to start moving. And, you know, we're getting, like, messages like, like, where is it? Why is this taking so long? And it's just, like, there's literally nothing, like, we can do. Like, we are up against, like, like, like literal logistical impossibilities. So stuff like that can just really throw a monkey wrench in there. And, like, thanks to just because of our preparedness, because Skybound knows what they're doing, 
you know, we were able to like stay on top of that and get it out roughly still on time. Um, and luckily we did not have to deal with that this time, but yeah, yeah. shipping and thank you. Shipping is just, is a, is a real beast and production. Like if you do it by yourself, God bless you. But my God, (laughs) like I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it now. I would, <laughs> it wouldn't be worth it. I, if I had to make a book by myself again, uh, there'd never be another Mr. Lovenstein book. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Big shout out to Skybound then. All right, let, let's pull ourselves out of the weeds and talk about something fun, which is Mr. Lovenstein Presents Feelings. There is, there's something interesting here. I mean, the whole book is interesting, but I want to highlight one, one specific thing, and that is the special guest authors that you have in mm-hmm. this collection. You've got nine special book exclusive guest comics from other web comic authors, including Extra Fabulous, one of my personal favorites, uh, Litterbox Comics, Hot Paper Comics, Cassandra uh, Callen, uh, Cyanide and Happiness uh, makes an mm-hmm. appearance here. And, and I want to know, is, is the web comic space, I guess looking at this, I think, oh, it must be a very collaborative space you know you brought up the story about cyanide and happiness you know sharing one of your early comics and that really boosting your work and i guess is this you returning the favor or is this just kind of like the nature of web comic creators like you guys all look out for one another no we are one big happy family this is not out of the norm we are always trying to help each other and support each other um it's it's a it's a wonderful community I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. Um, like we just strongly believe that a rising tide raises all ships. So we are always collaborating with each other. I I've been, I've done guest art on like four five, six other Kickstarter projects for my friends. Um, and yeah, this is, it's, it's great that they're always willing to like help out. Um, and, beyond just like making guest work for like books and stuff. Like sometimes we'll just straight up, just do a collab comic where we just like, Hey, let's work on a comic together. Let's like, I'll do the art, you do the writing and stuff like that. Yeah. We are always boosting each other. That is, that's awesome to hear. Uh, I, I do, I, I don't know if I should inject this soil. Let me think about that transition. That is awesome to hear. And as someone that, runs a a local podcast group here in, here in Jacksonville. Um, mm-hmm. We stress, you know, uh, what is it? Oh my God, I almost forgot our own tagline. Collaboration and community over competition because of that same thought yes. process where, you know, Absolutely. if we all help each other out, we all kind of gain because we're building, you know, and strengthening the industry and in the mm-hmm. ecosystem of podcasting. That's great to hear. That's kind of like the same thing in web comics, which is probably, you know, true in all kind of creative endeavors and, and hobbies and things like that. The other feature I want to bring up, so aside from the guest comics, which I think is a, is a fantastic addition, the other interesting aspect to this new book, Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings, is that you've included secret panels. And, and I guess let me take a yes. step back. This is collecting, so it's over 200 pages of comics in here. It's, is it one, safe to assume a lot of these you've posted on your website or they've been out in the public for a while? But for those that maybe have seen these comics, the other draw for this book, other than having it in a nice book format, is that you've included secret panels or additional panels for each comic. Is that is that mm-hmm. accurate? Yes. Um, so the secret panels are kind of like a hallmark of uh, Mr. Levenstein. Um, and how it works online is uh, I, I, get, I post the whole comic for you for free. I'm a good guy on, you know, whatever social media you like. But to support me a little bit and give you a little extra bonus, I drop a link to Tapas. Tapas is like my digital publisher. They're great too. And on there, I have the, you know, secret panel. And the only way you see that is if you go there. So if you either you know about the link I'm dropping or you're you already like regularly read tapas and then you know the secret panel originally it was just like an inside joke in my community where i was just hiding them on my website 
and I didn't even tell you about them. And then I would just put them on a, a, the off comic. And then people started expecting them, be like, hey, there was no secret panel on this one. So I was like, okay, I guess I got to do it for every single comic. And as uh, the internet advanced and it became harder and harder to get people to go to your website, I realized I had this like pretty good hook, right? Of get your comic and then even more fun stuff if you click this link. Um, and a big question I got when I was putting out these books, because people love the secret panels, is like, how are you, are you going to have the secret panels in the book? And how are you going to do it? You know, like, how are you going to hide them? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, you know, for fun, I was like thinking of like, oh, okay, what kind of crazy ways can I do it? Can you know, like, I have like a, you know, like a flip up, like a little flap and you, you see hmm. the secret panel or, yeah, yeah. you know, so, kind of like you gotta wear special glasses to see you know ridiculous stuff like that but the elegant solution we came to was you know you have the comic on the on the page on the right and then you turn the page and on the back of that is a secret panel so what i like is that you know you get your whole you get the comic like you would anywhere else and you enjoy it and you laugh you turn the page and then you get another extra joke so that, yeah, no, the, I, uh... I, I mean, full transparency, I, I, I ended up getting a, a digital co uh, copy and, you know, it's, you're swiping the whole time. And I still found these secret panels pretty effective because right. they look different too, right? They're not in yes. color. The yep. main comic is in full color, uh, which by the way, I got to say your color palette as someone that uh, works in marketing and, and works in, in design specifically and branding, your color palette is choice, dude. Like seriously. Thank you. But I found that the secret panel in the digital version, you know, the difference being that it's in black and white. So I thought that was a good contrast. And now I'm like, well, now I got to go get the print. That's a good incentive is what I'm trying to get at. That is a really good incentive <laughs> that you're including that in the print form, you know? Yeah. And then in addition to that, in the book, in Feelings, I did, I want to say a dozen comics exclusively just for the book that aren't wow, okay. anywhere they're online or i've never posted them anywhere and uh when i did failure i did not do secret panels i did the book exclusives and this time around i was like i gotta write a wrong here so the <laughs> this the the secret comics in my book come with their own secret panels so every comic gets its its secret panel in this one do you have, is there any specific, now, I mean, it's, it's going to be kind of hard to, you know, describe these or, you know, I don't want to, to ruin the punchline or jokes for any of these, but do you have any favorite strips in this collection that might mean maybe something a little more than the rest or for any personal reasons? Gosh, try to make me choose between my babies. <laughs> um, I mean... You know, there's the comics that I like them because they just do so well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, thank you for being a popular comic. Yeah, the breadwinners. Some that, yeah, the breadwinners. Um, yeah, they're my breadwinners. Um, and then some that I just, I like what I conveyed in the comic. And I think a good marriage of those two things was the uh, Walkin' Buds comic. Oh, yeah. I feel like I just hit all the notes on that one, and uh, I did want it to. But when be... you say, but real quick, when you say you hit all the notes, what are some of those notes that you need to hit for you to say this is you know top tier? Right. So it's cute, which helps. Mm. It's got so it's got cute animals. It's relatable in that like sometimes. Uh, when you're trying to like make it with a friend or like keep a friendship, you maybe <laughs> don't tell them everything. So I guess it helps to explain the comic is just like, it's two birds. One's a penguin, one's a pigeon. And the penguin is, you know, like it's, you know, like I like that we have each other since neither of us can fly and, you know, pigeons can fly. I pick pigeons because they're also just kind of lazy and like to walk for some reason. <laughs> and so 
the patient's like, oh, he's about to say like, oh, I'm, I'm lazy. I actually can. And then the penguin reveals that he'd made this shirt as a gift for the both of them to wear. That is them holding hands, walking. And it's, you know, the walk, we're, we're in the walking buds club. So the pigeon keeps quiet, puts the shirt on. So I don't know. It just, it, it hits an emotional, you know, like, you know, like, it resonates emotionally. It resonates as like friendship, and it's funny. You know, it's it's funny that the this penguin doesn't realize a pigeon can't fly, um, and just ends up being this nice heart heartwarming thing that people love. Now that walking, but that comic that you you just explained. As I'm going through my research and I'm I'm kind of reading comments on you know various threads within the Kickstarter itself. It seemed that that comic was specifically mentioned a few times. Like people were asking for, are we going to get a walking bud shirt like the one in the comic? And I think <laughs> you guys actually offered in the, the Kickstarter campaign, like a enamel pen to that yep. to some extent. Do you, do you find a direct correlation between like the, the strips that, that like you just said, hit all the notes for you with, with the ones that, that I guess generate, the attention and and our beloved like like this one for example did you see it becoming a thing like that people are wanting the shirt that are you know looking for bonuses or bonus rewards Mm -hmm. for that i so sometimes when i make a comic i think i got a winner on my hands and it bombs you know i'm like what went wrong here like what how am i so out of sync but then there are other times where I make a comic like like walking buds and as I'm making it I just like I can feel it in my bones like hmm. people are going to like this like I like this like when I really like something you know, the odds go up that other people are going to like it and why I did I did not really predict that people would want the shirt that seems so obvious now in like hindsight but I, I wasn't really thinking about that. I was thinking about the whole comic as, you know, in its entirety and the gift was just kind of a means to, you know, to the end, to getting to the, the, the final panel. And I, I remember the, the first day I posted that and it was just like immediately people were like, I want the shirt. Where's the shirt? I want the shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, Oh my God, I'm so stupid. I should have just, and I, you know, I made it look like the shirt in the comic. And so by the time I got to making the feelings book, like I knew I wanted to feature the Walking Buds Club comic prominently because it does like really capture the ethos of, you know, of the book of feelings. Um, so, yeah, like the pin and, and you know, like little stickers of the birds because um, they're just cute. They're just really cute. And yeah, so really, I I rarely go in thinking like, oh man, once, once this comic's done, I'll be able to sell X, Y, Z, you know, and it, it really is almost always backwards where, I, you know, people demand it and I go, oh, that makes sense. Hmm. It, it happened with a different comic, which I think's in the book. It's like a, like a little rock. And it's like these two dudes talking about how much they, lo- they love rock. And they're talking about music and they got like rock band shirts on. Um, and it turns out like it's like a stone on the ground that's like like oh my god they love me but the shirts they're wearing i just was like um i don't want to do just straight up band stuff so i made like parody shirts and one was like it was kiss but it said i hope it's okay to say this on on your podcast but it said piss <laughs> and uh, then it was like a parody of acdc where it said like you know uh bcad and people were like when i posted that like every time people were like I want those shirts i want those shirts and i still have resisted to this day maybe i'll i'll change but it's just like i don't know if i want to sell a shirt that just says piss on it <laughs> but yeah stuff like that happens all the time justin to use your own words against you for the next kickstarter campaign that is a wrong that you need to write in the next campaign we need the shirts man we need piss shirts now yeah now you brought up you know, the fans, the Mr. Levenstein fans, you've brought up the community, you know, how they support you. And I was, I was curious, 
if there is overlap is there what is the overlap like between web comic fans and say comic strip fans and do you see as, as someone that's in the field uh, you know doing it do you see like outside of like the the means uh the, the vehicle for delivering these comics like is there any major differences like uh you know, obviously, I, I know probably the the way they're made and and whatnot. But in in your eyes, like, is there much overlap between you know your traditional comic strip fans and, and web comic fans, or even like the process and how they're made and distributed? So when you say comic strips, do you mean like uh, like newspaper stuff, or do you mean like straight up comic books with like superheroes and stuff? Uh, well, I'm talking. Okay, I, I guess let me let me try to uh, to rephrase that one. Like, if I was to ask you who's in your Mount Rushmore of comic creators, would it Mm -hmm. be, would it be, I don't know, would I be silly to assume that maybe a lot of webcomic creators, I guess pulling out a little bit, have, I don't know, like Charles Scholes or uh, uh, Bill Watterson or Jim Davis on that Mount Rushmore? Or is it such a, you know, a a niche webcomic that it's their own, you know, ecosystem and, and whatnot? Like, does, traditional newspaper comic strips kind of overlap right. or feed into the web comic community at all? That is a great question. Um, Cause we, we tussle with that a lot as web comic artists. Like I've said a few times already, like I do find it strange that we call our stuff web comics still. It feels very antiquated. You know, it'd be like calling videos, like a Netflix show, like a web video. Like it would sound silly. Um, but it's, it's just, it really is stuck. And it really has made like a, a clean demarcation between stuff that we read in mm. newspapers and stuff we read online. Even though you can read everything online. Even Gary Larson doesn't want you to. You know, they're, they're like, there's a um, National Cartoonist Society, I think it's called. And it's got everybody you named and more in there and it has very few webcomic artists in there so it almost feels more like old guard versus like the newer younger people Um, because the thing with uh comic strips as you describe them like in newspapers is just like they just don't happen anymore right like it is so extremely rare for someone to get syndicated in newspapers you know like you are competing with dead people at this point. Like you are like, they still put Hmm. peanuts comics in the newspaper. And I think that's just as newspapers continue to die as their slow death. I think that's just the way it's going to be. But I will say speak. I I don't know if I can speak for all of us, but um, we do pay a lot of respect to the artists who came before us. We're just building on top of them. You know, we're staying on giants. Hmm. And, you know, we always had the advantage of reading their stuff growing up and learning. Um, and they put in the work and figured stuff out. You know, like, you compare comics from the 1920s to the 1950s to 1980s and just see that evolution. Hmm. It's just continuing on today. It just happens to be online. The one thing I'll say that separates us, at least... This might be changing is like there was no there's no control on a webcomic like there was on a syndicated comic strip, right? Like there's a lot of rules you had to follow if you wanted to appear in a newspaper. Like obviously censorship, no swearing, the just because of the nature of the paper, you had to be black and white, it had to be simple, it had to fit into like four panels nicely, you know, laid out on a sheet of paper. It's a lot of constraints that webcomics do not have. And that has led to just an absurd amount of variety and voices that you didn't see, like voices from small groups, you know, minorities, niche groups, niche fan bases. Uh, and that gives them a way of communicating and, you know, talking about themselves and their, their, their lived experiences. And I think that's what makes webcomics just their own special thing that as great as the comic strips of the past were, I just think webcomics are just that much more greater because there's no barrier to entry. Anybody 
can talk about whatever they want through them and it can be beautiful it can be ugly it can be short it can be long and it can feature anybody you want so yeah that's a great question we we talk about it a lot <laughs> that is a fantastic answer though thank you for for sharing that insight and i guess i will follow up that question where uh, if you had to create like a, a mount rushmore of your favorite comic <laughs> creators illustrators you know kind of an umbrella term whether they be web comics mm -hmm. print newspaper etc like who is on your mount rushmore when you think about the creators that are pivotal to your story that continue to inspire you that you feel like stand the test of time well that's so hard so it's gonna be a mix so I do. I would put Charles Schultz on my Mount Rushmore. I do think he just he did things that nobody else was doing way back in like the fifties. You know, like you forget how old the Peanuts were and just how dark it could get, how like melancholy it could be, subversive in ways. It's funny to think of Peanuts now as subversive, but it really was. Um, and he kept. He was so consistent throughout his whole career and i i read a ton of peanuts growing up i got several books um i love the characters i love the way he writes i love his art um and also i would put up on there i think it's ernie bushmiller i think is his name embarrassing if i forgot it but he does uh he did nancy which not a lot of people bring up, you know, like people often bring up, you know, Kelvin Hobbs and the far side. But I think Nancy is just one of the greatest comic strips ever created. It's just so creative and legit makes it still makes me laugh out loud. Just off the wall, like it's really hard to predict which direction it's going to go in. I've taken, I've taken a ton of inspiration from them. And then I only got two more spots left. So I got to, I got to wrap up my community and I got to say uh, with a bullet, uh, Perry Bible fellowship by Nick Gearwich. Um Not only is it worthy of being on Mount Rushmore, I think it's maybe the best comic series ever made. And he's still making them. It's just, He's just like head and shoulders better. You ever just like see something so much better than anything else, like so good? You're just like, <laughs> there's no comparison. Like, how yeah. could anybody look at this and think there's something better? Like, it's the art is it's almost aggravating. And, yeah, it's yeah. Like almost it's aggravating like, how unfair. Uh, you see yeah, it, and you and know and that you'll never point, be better. To your point about the art, because I'll be fully honest with you, I did not. I guess I've seen these comics before, but I've never associated the name. Now I know it's Perry Fellowship Bible. And, and I think a part of that is that the art style ranges so much that yes. sometimes I think I don't associate, you know, Perry Fellowship Bible with that strip. And then I ended up learning, oh, no, that is, that's the same guy, you know, he, you know, so yes. yeah, it is, it is some profoundly great comics. Yeah. And just so funny, like on top of the art it's just some of the funniest stuff i've witnessed as a human being is in a perry bible fellowship comic strip um and the the, the last one's tough the last slot because there's just so many great web comic artists but i think i i it's it's funny because it's like three guys, but I have to say Cyanide Happiness as well. We've met, we name dropped them multiple times already. You know, it's it's three guys, so it's like a Cerebus three headed beast that's off to the side of the Rushmore. If we're going to continue the metaphor, just because those guys have just the massive, massive impact they had on web comics and just comics as they exist online and just pushing boundaries and just so creative in all the directions that they've gone on and doing it with like very simplistic art. Like I just got done praising uh, PBF, but like remarkable what they were able to do with a purposely restrictive, like stick figure art style. And they're still doing it to this day. You know, they've been going at it for like 20 years. Uh, it's, it's, just, is it's hard to measure their impact. Which is 
saying something, right? You said that they've been going on for, for 20 years. I feel like if you asked anyone, when's the first time they were made aware of cyanide and happiness, you'd get like a range of answers. One, I didn't know they went back that far. I knew they were around for a while, but to me, they are probably the most, I don't know, they're, they're like, they're really modern, you know, and, but when you juxtapose it with how long they've been in, well before like social media was really like a, a thing in our, a part of our everyday lives, I feel like you look at their comics now and it feels like a part of the social media DNA. Like you brought up yes. web comics sometimes being referred to as memes. And I, I agree, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's art. I think memes sometimes is a little, not, I want to say derogatory, but it, it undercuts like the effort and, and real artisticness to a thing. But it's hard to not say that they've kind of helped develop like that modern web comic meme. Like how many, how many times have you, so, has someone online sent you a comic of theirs or a panel or, or whatever it is? Like they've been around so long and I think they probably have a comic for every feeling, every thought, every yeah. experience like you could <laughs> ever go through. Yeah, they, they've, they've tapped into like every subject matter yes. humanly possible <laughs> and made it funny. Yeah, that is a solid. That is a solid Mount Rushmore, my friend. Thank you for 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 doing that. Impossible and, and task, to, but I uh, tried my best. Nah, you knocked it out of the park. All right, Justin. Uh, as we, as we're getting to the to the end of this, I I want to go back and get you uh, get some advice from you, right? For the aspiring creator that is listening right now, I'm, I'm going to say creator as as just a general thing. Whether there it's someone that is aspiring to be the next web comic superstar or you mm -hmm. know is trying to do traditional newsprint or, or comic books what advice do you have for those aspiring creators and and maybe if you could tailor it to something that you wish that someone would have told you when you first started that would have made your life a lot easier what, what would that be oh i've answered this question quite a few times and it's always it's always tough but um I'd say the most important thing that any creator has to do, and this is painfully obvious, is you have to create. And that sounds bizarre, but there are so many people who get stuck in the like planning and conceptual phases of things. Like, think of the your friend who's a quote unquote musician who's just always noodling around on their instrument, but never together a song or an album you know like they just can't get there you have to you have to create and you have to create a lot and now that we're in an age where it is so easy to reach the world through the internet once you are once you're comfortable with what you're creating if you start small like small online communities or something like that you have to get other people looking at it and you have to like Ignore the haters, the extreme people, but you have to take what they're saying, really absorb their feedback. You know, if something's not working, you have to be willing to adapt. You have to be willing to evolve. You have to be willing to like be critical of yourself. Not so critical that you freeze up and you can't do anything. Um, and keep going, even if you're afraid of it, of it bombing. If you're afraid of looking like a fool, like a like a um just know that like all of us have made some of the worst things that we just absolutely like are so embarrassed by and hate but because we made those awful awful things that got us to where we made the good stuff right it's all on like the same journey so just getting over just like that apprehension of creating and then once you're in it the apprehension of failing, like that will get, take you so far, especially truly if you are willing to adapt and evolve, like if something's not working, you got to change and you got to strive and push yourself to get better. Um, and the, the other big thing I'll say, if you really want to specifically get into like web comics or something like that is, and this is a mistake I made was like you you need to engage with the uh, webcomic community like the other artists around you like and just find people that you gel with you don't just you don't have to like go to like 
the biggest, most popular artists and start like begging them for attention. There's always going to be someone in like your sphere, at your skill level, at your audience size that you can bounce ideas off with, you know, talk about your strategies and just shoot the shit. Sorry if I swore. Um, uh, and just talk about you know, the process and like collaborate and stuff like that and boost each other and help each other. And if you are a good member of this, this webcomic community, people will notice you, people will recognize you and they'll want to put a spotlight on you. I am always doing that. I'm always like looking out for up and coming artists because it makes me feel great. If I find something awesome and the only thing holding them back is they just, not enough people are looking at it and I can just unleash my audience on them and and then they can see like, oh, I got something good going on. If you're if you're putting the stuff out there, you will be found. So that's that's my advice. I, well, hope, I hope it helps. <laughs> no, that was uh, that was solid. Solid advice. And that's a stand up move, Justin, to put the spotlight on someone else. That that says a lot about you. Um I, I wanted it for me, really quick- so Got to pay it forward. Damn right. Return the favor. Uh, you brought up something uh, about the creative process and, you know, embracing kind of the suck. And I want to recommend something that I kind of found out about through you in a tangential way. Have you ever heard of the Ira Glass or Ira Glass, you know, famous NPR podcaster? Uh, he has a, I don't think it's a video. I think it might just be him explaining like the creative process. But he talked mm-hmm. about the creative process. Part of that is, sucking like just knowing you're gonna suck in the beginning and the only way to get better is by doing the reps and embracing the suck i will admit that i i was made aware of of you know his statements on that and if you type in ira glass creative process in google it'll show you like a couple videos and i'm assuming it's like an audio thing but i found out i found that via one of your amas on reddit i think you were on like r comics doing an AMA and someone had shared, I think asked a pretty similar question, advice for aspiring creators. And someone in the comments had shared this Ira Glass thing, which I want to bring up your AMA on Reddit, which I think was in 2021 when failure came out, is one of the most entertaining AMAs I have ever been through. I damn near read (laughs) every single question (laughs) and post. And I got to ask because you responded, you responded, but you hyperlinked all your responses to, to a comic. And, I, and I'm curious, did you draw every single, I mean, it was like a hundred responses or questions that you were responding My God. to. Did you draw a comic for every single question? That, so you're talking about was the actually AMA for feelings, which I did uh, okay. last oh, okay. year. It was for feelings. Yeah. And uh, I did, I drew, I drew almost every response on the spot. Holy shit. That just to, is just hella impressive, man. Yeah, just yeah, like you said, to just make it all the more fun and entertaining. Nah, that's cool. Yeah. I will, uh, I will include a, a link to that in the show notes, but it's pretty easy to find if you look for uh, uh, JL West over AMA. Uh, absolutely awesome read through. So, thank you. I guess with that said, Short Box Nation, we are wrapping up our conversation with Justin Westover, who has a new book coming out called Mister Levenstein. Is it Levenstein or Levenstein? Have I been saying it wrong this whole time? I say Stein. Uh, most people say Stein, okay. and it does not bother me okay. one iota. I don't All right, care. there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, Justin has a new book. It's called Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings. It's available everywhere you get books, whether they be in a comic shop, in a bookstore, on, or on digital platforms like Kindle and Google Play. Mr. Levenstein Presents Feelings, available everywhere. Uh, as someone who has read early review i'm telling you you will get in your feelings but in the best way you know and sometimes you just gotta embrace the feelings whether it be happiness Mm -hmm. sadness crying or as the the back matter says or being horny it's all Mm -hmm. of that inside of feelings part of the human condition damn right justin justin do you have any closing remarks any last things that you want to say anything we didn't touch on here's your chance i think i think we said it all and uh I just want to say this has been a uh, fantastic interview. You've, you've asked some great questions. I've had, I've had a lot of fun doing this. I appreciate that, man. I, I do my best. Uh, best of luck with the, the rest of the release. I will absolutely be on Thank the lookout you. for whatever you got next. 
And now that I know that you continue do, to do weekly comics, I'll be checking that out as well. I know. Thank you very much.